Tuesday. We've made it halfway through the week. We are back with another edition of Wind Down Wednesday here for you on the Crescent Lake Club. And this week we have a guest I'm super excited for this installment of what I'm calling Wine School. So you both know me and Courtney and we'll catch up with you on other stuff later. But I want to introduce tonight's guest, Papillon Prince. Tell us a little bit about yourself. Hey, sorry, Joe. My name is Papillon. I am a certified wine sommelier. Um, I actually used to live in Santa Barbara as well and made wine for a while. And I've been published in Wine Spectator Magazine and Tasting Panel Magazine as well. So I'm sure you guys have loved as Courtney and I over the past few weeks and episodes have tried to give you our um, advice and notes on the wine that we try every week. So I thought this time you guys are tired of listening to us. Let's bring in a pro. And so what we did is I gave Papillon free range to pick whatever wine she wanted. I did give her some notes. You know, as you guys know, Courtney loves red. I like red, but prefer it to be a little more on the juicy or fruity side. And I think what Papillon picked is a home run for both of us. So Papillon, if you want to take it away. Okay, yeah, so um, tonight we're going to be tasting a red Burgundy. So Burgundy is a wine region in France. They grow two great varieties there, and it's going to be Pinot Noir and Chardonnay. So if you're drinking red Burgundy, you're always drinking Pinot Noir, and if you're drinking white Burgundy, you're always drinking Chardonnay. So this one in particular is actually going to be from the southern part of Burgundy, and um, it's 100% Pinot Noir, like I said. This is going to be um, a vineyard that's been run by the same family since the 1700s. Um, it is sustainably farmed and it is also organic. It's going to be on 25 hectares of land and one hectare in uh, Europe is equal to two and a half acres in America. Um, so I actually put this wine in the refrigerator about 30 minutes before I decided to taste it. I think you should always probably put a little chill on your red wine. And uh, I often say that Americans serve their white wines too cold and their red wines too warm. So they kind of almost should be about the same temperature, around like 65 degrees. Especially with something like a Pinot Noir, because it is a very light bodied wine, it definitely does better with a little bit of a chill on it. So let's go ahead and taste this guy. So whenever you're tasting wine, I always suggest you swirl it a little bit, get a little air into the wine, and then stick your nose all the way in the glass. See what kind of fruits you get out of it, if there's any like florality to it. I'm getting a lot of like red fruit, cherries, raspberries. Um, and now we can taste it to see if everything that we're smelling is on the palate as well. Just take a sip. I always suggest swishing it around your mouth like mouthwash so you can get your entire tongue engaged on what you're tasting here. So now that I've tried it, I definitely think that I'm getting the same thing on the palate that I got on the nose. Lots of red fruit, lots of raspberries, lots of cherries, a little bit of underripe fruit too. There's a little bit of greenness in here. And to me, that's going to indicate that it's a little bit youthful. This is a 2018 vintage. Um, and so this is more like a lighter, easier drinking wine. It only has about a five year shelf life you know i mean you can definitely have it a little bit older than that but that's really when it's going to peak it's about five years from here all right and then another thing you're always wanting to look at when you're tasting wine too is where is the acid level on this wine so you take a sip of it and see if it makes you salivate right back here and swish it around your mouth again and see how much it makes you salivate yeah I think that definitely has a decent amount of acid to it, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So with that, yeah, all the way back in here, yeah, that it's from a cooler climate. So the higher acidity in a wine, usually the cooler the region that it's from, and that just has to do with photosynthesis. But not as if it was from a warmer region, a lot more sugar would have developed in the fruit before they harvested it and fermented it. So not as much sugar was in this wine at the time of harvest. So it's going to have more acidity to it. What do you ladies think? Do you like it? Love it. I definitely get a lot of cherry and like fleshy ripe fruit yeah. in it. Not so much apricot, but more, yeah, 
maybe cherry, maybe a little bit of peach, raspberry, you know, just really kind of juicy fruits. When I opened it up, so I chilled it for a little bit um, and then I opened it up. I didn't decant it, obviously, but as soon as I popped the cork, I could just, all I got was just a cherry bomb straight mm -hmm. out of the bottle. So I'm like, oh, I know I'm going to like this one. <laughs> but yeah, but yeah, definitely, definitely get a lot of the acid feel, especially on the back end, but it's not anything that's cloying or it hangs around right. too long. Right, right. And then another way to chill, we were talking about on the nose here, is how to decide the level of intensity of the aromas from the nose right here. Can you smell it from here, from here, or from here? So, I just got my nails done, so I just smelled my nails. <laughs> <laughs> you have to get Probably your street not. ready. Usually, yeah, exactly. The best He's gonna be like, "This smells no. like acetone." Um, but no, I can. It's about medium intensity. <laughs> you can smell it from here. Yeah. Not as much from here. Yeah. Yeah, just 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 lightly floral, not a whole lot. I just get mostly mostly fruit, and you know what? The floral smell could just be because my entire block smells like jasmine or honeysuckle right now. So oh, I yeah. think that's yeah. that's <laughs> all I can smell. Everywhere. Is, it's just everywhere. Yeah. So yeah. In case you guys missed it, Papillon is also located here in New Orleans, just like Courtney and myself. So you, know, um, what's it like working in the wine industry? in new orleans well it's definitely a lot of fun uh the wine industry of itself is just it's a lot of fun it's a lot of knowledge definitely have a lot of things to learn about regions and soils and climates and all that stuff. but obviously it's a very fun thing to learn about and i very much like my job i'm a wine sales rep um and i do some private tastings for people on the side as well i just always like to educate the public about wine so i think it's very important and that not enough people know enough about it because it is something that's important to learn for sure. And well, I already know the answer to this question, but what is your favorite region of wine, a region for wine? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So one of the first times Papillon and I had wine together and she gave me a wine tasting was with another wine from the Burgundy region. And she really opened my eyes up to white Burgundy is fantastic also because i think she gets annoyed every time i say i'm drinking a rosé i think that really <laughs> just drives her nuts no i i mean there is definitely quality rosé i just i never should spend a whole lot of money on it. no um probably 20 dollars, 25 max is what you want to spend on a rosé but yeah so and this wine for the flavor of it and the nice balance and the finish it has I'm really surprised at the price point for this one because this one is right under $20. Yep. So oh, it's wow. an incredible, yeah, it's an incredibly affordable glass of wine. Absolutely. Absolutely. Mr. Worldwide already stole some. Um, you know, so I, I made risotto with um, snow pea shoots and asparagus for dinner tonight. And I think this goes really, really well with everything that I made. What other things would you suggest with this wine well there's actually a lot of things i think would go well with this wine um definitely oh. salmon I know. sorry I have a it's okay um i would say like salmon tuna um some chicken um maybe even like rabbit um pate i was i would think that if you're going to pair cheese with this too you could either do like a mild brie or a mild goat cheese um but you know, wine and cheese just belong together no matter what. So yeah, yeah. all it's missing, all it's missing is chocolate. Yeah. That's we're the, we're the three best friends that anyone has ever had. Sure. <laughs> so, so Courtney, what do you think about the wine? Um, I think it's really good. I I enjoy drinking wine. I know very little about tasting wine, and you know, Keely always takes the lead on purchasing and making the selections <laughs> and doing the tasting notes for this. Um, it's just, again, I enjoy drinking it, but I don't know a lot about it. So I've already learned so much in the, you know, 10 minutes that we've been talking. <laughs> I do know that I like Pinot Noir and I really, really like this. Um, and it's at a great price point. Um, I, it's, I could see drinking it like all summer cause it's not, I don't know, it's, it's light. Not super, yeah. It's not super heavy. Like it's not as thin and as light as like a Beaujolais or something like that. But it still has a little more weight to it, but it's not something that I feel like I, 
I need just a big steak to really kind of even my palate out. Like I sometimes feel with, you know, um, another old world, like a cab or a Merlot or something like that. Um, but again, like I said, I always like, I like, I prefer if I'm drinking like a full red wine, I would like it to be juicier than spicier. And again, like you said, if you put just a little chill on this one, definitely a great summer warm. I mean, you could yeah. do this by the pool, you know? Yeah. And I think even like some of those heavier wines that maybe some people shy away from every once in a while, try putting it in the fridge for a little bit before you taste it. And I guarantee it's going to have a totally different flavor profile. And then as it like is open for a little bit, it's going to change as well. I mean, life or wine is just kind of like a living organism, you know, it's going to change constantly. So any day that you open it, it's going to be a different wine, which is kind of cool. So have you had a wine that you, or a style that you weren't expecting to like, but you just happened to have one kind of bottle and your mind was blown by it. You totally understand why people like this kind of wine. Um, probably, uh, you know, I, I didn't really expect to like left bank or right bank Bordeaux as much because it's Merlot dominant. You know, you hear so much terrible things about Merlot or whatever. And honestly- I'm not I, drinking any Merlot. Right, from that movie. <laughs> yeah. Merlot. But Merlot is a fantastic grape. Um, it does not get enough credit by any stretch of the imagination. And on the right bank of Bordeaux, they plant a lot of Merlot. And on the left bank of Bordeaux is where some of the most expensive wines in the world come from. Um, we're talking, we had one on a uh, wine list that I at a restaurant that I worked at for $15,000. So very expensive stuff. Yeah. <laughs> but the right bank is a little more affordable from time to time. I mean, there's still expensive wines from the right bank as well, but the fact that it's in the low dominant, I just didn't expect that I would rather almost drink from the right bank of Bordeaux than the left. So that was a little shocking to me. Interesting. I think mm -hmm. mine is more like, I don't typically like German. So like Riesling, Gewürztraminer, all that kind of this really sweet wine. So I tend to definitely go more French. Well, kind of like with everything in life, I'm generally going to pick anything from France first. Right, right. Well, Riesling doesn't necessarily have to be a sweet wine either. That it depends on how much uh, sugar is in the grape at the time of harvest and also how much they ferment the sugar out. So if you get a Riesling that has a lower alcohol content, like 8%, then it's going to be a sweeter wine. If it's like 11 percent alcohol then it's going to be a drier style riesling huh. so with mother's day coming up what would you recommend for any of our male viewers to potentially get for say their wives who might host a weekly wine show <laughs> um, bubbles obviously always bubbles um i could drink bubbles with anything everything always and forever um obviously champagne is the most Famous sparkling wine region in the world, but I also really like um, Cava's from Spain, and they're very inexpensive, but still very high quality, produced in almost the exact same way as Champagne. Or if there's something a little more um, unknown, but uh, Italian sparkling wine called Francia Corta is going to be from northern Italy, and it's made from two out of the same three grapes as Champagne, so they're very similar mm. as well, and it's a lot uh, less expensive than true Champagne. Um, true champagne. Yeah, and there's a couple of American sparklings that are really good as well. So, but bubbles, always bubbles. <laughs> always bubbles. Always. So, you mentioned American wines, and you worked in Santa Barbara for a while. Why don't you talk a little bit about that? That's I remember when you told me about working at a winery. Just how interesting it is. Yeah, it was awesome. Um, I got to work a wine harvest out there. So. The grapes are ready to pick in the Northern Hemisphere between the months of August, September, and October. And the Southern Hemisphere, they harvest the grapes in February, March, and April. Um, so I was out there for about three or four months um, and we did a harvest out of a uh, vineyard. And then I worked at two tasting rooms out there too. And it's about maybe two, three hours North of LA. So on the weekends, it was like all these people from LA would come up and come try the wines. And it was like a very small town. It was about 300 people. It's called Los Olivos. Very, very cute little town. Um, but it was just so much fun walking up and down the roads of all the vines and just seeing how beautiful the fruit is and the landscape and everything. I mean, it's just gorgeous out there. So I haven't been to Santa Barbara. 
wine country. I've only been to Napa and Sonoma and honestly, I've spent most of the time, my wine time in Sonoma and there is just something magical. The last time we went, we did like a van tour. So a guy came and picked us up at our hotel mm -hmm. and we could tell him ahead of time what places we want to go, wanted to go to or what we liked. And he just kind of took us around and just you drive up and you drive through all of the vineyards and you'd end up in a tasty room. You try wine, you buy wine, you drink in the van on the way to the next vineyard. It's just, there's, when the weather is perfect, it wine just touring vineyards is amazing. Some of them would have bands or jazz trios. Some would have some kind of food if you wanted any of that. We usually have lunch in um, Sonoma just because there's a really great um, beer kind of restaurant in there too in the city center of Sonoma. But I'm really, there's, it's probably something Courtney and I will talk about later when we get to our travel spot, but there is a new cruise that is starting out of LA in the fall that is going to um, Catalina. Basically it's, there's, it's over five days with um, two stops or Catalina for sure. And um, it begins with an E and why is it Ensenada? And it's basically, and it, so it's a lot of like that kind of region wine focused. And I'm like, oh, I think I can make that happen yeah. for a weekend. Amazing. Hmm. Um, yeah. So that is absolutely beautiful. It's one of my favorite wine regions in America. Um, I love the little town of Healdsburg. It's so cute. So cool. It's so nice out there. I mean, you know, people who make wine are just cool. They're just easy going, like, you know. Kind of They're just, because, you know? yeah, all you have to do all day is watch grapes grow and taste wine out of the barrels. And do a lot of cleaning. There's a lot of cleaning involved. There's a lot of cleaning, but, I mean, if it means that I can start and finish, start my day with wine, clean while I'm having the wine, and then finish my day with wine, I think I can, I think I can make it work. It's not a bad job, for sure. No. <laughs> no. Yeah. Yeah, because so have you done any vineyard tours or any kind of wine tripping like that, Courtney? I knew it came um, up as a potential for an anniversary trip. Yeah, it did. Um, we actually, we were in um, Virginia for Easter and we went to some interesting <laughs> winery there in Virginia. Um, I forgot the name of it. It was, um, it was, it was fine. <laughs> Um, I don't know that that area is necessarily known for having great wine, um, but yeah, it, like again, it was fine. It was just something to do because we were in, uh, we were near Smith Mountain Lake. I forgot the name of the vineyard um, in Virginia and a few other places here and there. I have not been to any um, California wineries though. Well, it's, it's definitely on the bucket list. Yeah, all 50 states actually produce wine. Really? So, I mean, yeah. I, I'm not gonna say they're all good, but all the right. things we produce wine. Um, you know, to me, I think obviously vines grow well in a more like a drier region. You kind of want the vines to struggle a little bit. You kind of want them to have to go down and find some water because that way you get a more concentrated berry come time of harvest. If not, you're gonna get a fat, flabby, lazy grape that's gonna have water in it, no concentration. The wine's just not gonna be quality at all. So. And places where it rains more, vines don't necessarily grow as well. That's why it's good in California because it's basically a desert out there. Yeah. Right. So. I don't know that I want to try what Louisiana wine tastes like. I mean, no, 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 no. I've never. I, I remember going to Strawberry Fest one year and trying strawberry wine, and that was yeah. disgusting. Something. <laughs> was, <laughs> was, it disgusting. Like was it like Boone's yeah. Farm? Yeah, Boone's Farm, pretty much, <laughs> pretty much. Yeah. Um. Yeah, like I've had some wine from Texas and there actually is a winery or vineyard out in West Texas that has been a semi-finalist and maybe a finalist for wine or for produce for a wine producer for the James Beard Awards. And that was pretty impressive to me just because, you know, I've had it since I was or I've heard about it since I was little and it was always kind of like a joke wine. You don't that's what you get to like 
bad cook with or to take to like the junior women's club meeting when you have to bring a bottle of wine and it's like seven dollars so this will work we'll just take this one um so that's impressive i know texas has come a long way in some of their wine making especially because it does have the varied climates within one state similar to kind of what california has so Papillon, what kind of advice would you give to someone that's getting interested in wine, especially going into a wine store or because we're still in a pandemic, trying to like order from Total Wine or Martin's or somewhere online and just drive up to pick up a bottle of wine. Do you go price point? Do you go style? Do you just, would you tell them just to pick the cutest label and Throw start from there? Throw a dart. What um, label speaks to you the most? I guess there's a couple of things. First of all, definitely trust the people that work there. Kind of tell them stylistically what you're looking for and don't be afraid to try new things for sure. Um, I always encourage people to try European wine. I know that it's a little intimidating sometimes because the labels are not like they are in California. It's not very straightforward. It's more about like the regions there as opposed to the grape varieties. Well, yeah, here, so here's the, here's the label from this guy tonight. So it says Borgonia on it, and that's how the French say Burgundy. Um, so I would say Cabernet drink Burgundy. If you like Cabernet, drink Bordeaux. If you like uh, like a really big full body wine, maybe try Priorat from Spain. But I think giving European wine a chance, even though it can be intimidating, and you don't have to spend a lot of money for it to be good. There's Spain. Spain is definitely like the best value country in the world, and there's amazing bottles of Spanish wine for eight dollars. You know, yeah, you don't have to spend ten, twenty, thirty dollars for a great bottle of wine. You just don't. Yeah, and there, are, I feel like, and it's always kind of like a different, crazy flavor profile too. Like that's the one where Spanish wines are the ones where you can kind of get the fruity and juicy mixed right. in with a little bit of the spicy tobacco kind of flavoring mm -hmm. and they actually work they play really really well together yeah. so yeah that's i think spain is such a great value country for a couple of reasons i mean first of all their taxes are a lot lower there um and a lot of people that have been here there have owned them for generations and generations so they don't have like a mortgage on their land or whatever so you just get a better quality of wine for a less hmm. expensive price um like the taxes in france are very high and so French wine is going to be just a little more expensive. But at the same time, I mean, I think France, too, is the birthplace of wine in a lot of ways. And um, definitely some of the highest quality of wines in the world absolutely come from France. Probably the two yeah. expensive wine regions in the world are in France, with as they should be, because they're really great. Which is <laughs> which Champagne and? Well, Burgundy and Bordeaux. Burgundy. Okay. Yeah, and then Champagne. Those so are probably, that's probably, three. probably three. Right there. Yeah, those are probably the, the big three for sure. But right. yeah, I mean, unfortunately, a lot of red burgundies can be very expensive. Um, and I know people are shy away from the Chardonnay grape, and that is what white burgundy is, but it's such a different experience than Chardonnay from California. I feel like a lot of California Chardonnay is overly oaked and buttery, and it's actually a really beautiful grape. And if it grows in a cooler region, you get a lot more of that acidity and fruit that are in balance with one another, and they don't usually even oak age it at all. Sometimes it'll be neutral oak, or it'll just be like stainless steel fermentation. So maybe it doesn't see any oak at all. So I suggest definitely trying white burgundy whenever you can. Um, and I literally just wrote it down. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, so Papillon knows that I hate Chardonnay, like won't touch it, won't go near it. She goes, we're doing a tasting tonight like literally right now and we are going you're gonna go i know they have it at bromart go get this bottle right now i'm like okay see you at my house and i had white burgundy and my life was changed because i hate chardonnay i'm not so much on pinot gris or pinot grigio i'm also very picky about my sauvignon blancs i like them to be really young and almost clear and i want it to be apple not pear so yeah, i'm really cool. picky about i'm really picky well, about I'm, my wine. i'm going to visit my brother again this weekend and he's like red 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 only red so i'm going okay. to make him try this and it's my nephew's baptism so i'm gonna bring a bottle and this is what we're gonna try 
and yeah. I'll report back next week because I'm excited to try it. Awesome. Yeah, so I picked this up today from um, Brady's Wine Warehouse. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, and then that made it actually really, it's a lot easier to get from Brady's to get to the highway to get to your house than it <laughs> is from Martin. So it was super convenient, nice. but yeah, okay. I'm loving this. Absolutely loving it's it. It's really good. It's really good. Well, any other questions or Papillon, do you have anything else to share with us about wine tonight? Well, I think that's about it. Um, if anybody has any questions they um, want to ask you guys too, I can always answer them next week for sure. Yeah, sounds great. Okay. Well, thank you so much. No problem. Thank you. 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 Bye, Bye. Guys. Bye. Thanks. No problem. <laughs> oh, love it. That's, love that's it. so fun. Yeah. Um, See, it's great to have someone that knows about the wine talk about the wine. Yeah. Yeah. I can talk about Disney all day, but when it comes to wine, all I can say is I like it or I don't for the most part. Yeah, and she's so great because she knows her stuff, but it's not like stuffy in any right. way. It's, it's it's still just really approachable. And so you feel like you can come out of it just a little bit smarter about the wine. Yeah. The smell thing, or when she told me to start swishing it so you could get like feel it in the back. Like yeah. make sure it hits all your taste buds. Yeah, that's a craziest yeah. thing. So thanks again to Papillon. Um, if you guys are re-watching this um, because you follow us on YouTube, be sure to drop us some comments. If you have questions for Papillon, drop them to us and I can get her to answer and we can talk about it next week. So we're gonna move on from wine while still drinking wine because we do Obviously. have- uh, yeah, this bottle is not leaving this room. <laughs> Stay. I mean, me. I'm leaving. I'm going out of town tomorrow, so it's got to it's got to be finished. It's, I mean, it has to. You what? You can't just leave. You can't abandon it like this. No. Uh, so we've got a couple of Disney and travel topics to talk about to close out this week's Wind Down Wednesday. First, I just want to preview you guys. We are going to be covering the preview announcement of the new Disney cruise ship live tomorrow. So at 10 a.m. Central, 11 a.m. East Coast time on the Disney Parks blog, they've got a 30 minute video presentation where they are showing all of us what the new Disney Cruise Line ship, the Disney Wish is going to look like and some of the amenities that it will have for guests when it joins the fleet next year. Uh, we already got leaked to us some really cool pictures. We know that Rapunzel is painting the marquee on the back. We know that they've taken a completely different vibe for this lobby. Um, it is very much Cinderella Stunning. inspired. It is yes. there's Cinderella is the gold statue. Um, and you okay there? Yeah, no, sorry. I was just trying to make sure my shoes was turned off. And then um, it's very much castle inspired and it's a really light, bright, shiny, ethereal looking lobby. A lot of essentially what Cinderella's castle at Magic Kingdom used to look like before they painted all the pink parts. It's a lot of gray and silver and blues, all of the colors that I really, really like. And again, instead of one of the traditional Disney Cruise Line um, chandeliers, we've got more of like a scattered, almost like a firework kind of shooting star looking chandelier. I've got a picture of it, I'm gonna try and call it up. Um, but then we also got to see kind of a concept model, which begs a lot of questions of, it looks more like a roller coaster instead of the traditional water slide up on deck. So I'm really excited to see what they have to say. What do you think about what we might see at the Disney Witch announcement tomorrow? Um, I think there's, there's a few things. I really, I really, really, really love the lobby. Um, it does not, it's like some cruise ships, not necessarily Disney Cruise Line, but cruise ships can just feel gaudy and feel tacky. And this is the complete opposite. It feels very, like, I, I don't know, it almost, I wasn't on the Titanic, obviously, but it for some reason it's calling back that. Just like I, I don't know why. I just looking at the pictures, that was the first thing I thought of for some reason. 
I don't know, maybe just cruises automatically make me think of the Titanic. But I'm also, um, I love that Minnie is the, um, the what's the coin? What is it? It's like the Minnie Mouse is on, Captain Minnie is on yeah, the coin. She's the, she's, the, she's the captain of the ship, which everywhere yes. else has Mickey or Donald. Yes. But there's a so coin this, that's like in the, right? Oh, in the, in the atrium, there's like, yeah, I know what you're talking about. I can't remember yeah. what it's what it's called. I'm trying to look it up at the same time and talk. Um, but I'm excited. I'm excited to see what the um, itineraries are. Hopefully, I mean, we have to get that announcement tomorrow, right? About some itineraries. I have some theories. I have some theories. I think they're going to move the two old ships out of Fort Lauderdale and at least permaport one split time between year round between here and Galveston. I think this area proved that it will sell out the Disney cruise and, and with the new port edition coming through, um, it makes perfect sense for Disney to take on a terminal here in this city and especially the older ships. One of them has Tiana's restaurant on it. Tiana's yeah. place is on the Disney Magic. Yeah. How perfect would it be for that ship to be based here year round to serve the Gulf Coast versus out in Galveston? Okay. I th and I think that will be the ship that will likely take a repo at some point and handle Europe. And I think the Magic will be based almost permanently out of LA or San Diego to service Hawaii and uh, Alaska year round, mm -hmm. if not going to Japan and Asia to do that wow. outside. I have to guess that that's what they're ultimately thinking. And mm -hmm. that would probably move the fantasy down to being the only ship going out of Fort Lauderdale and Miami. And they would leave the dream to run out of Port Canaveral and still just do the short loops three and four days. And I think we'll see the wish will do, well, no, I think the dream will do seven day longer Caribbean tours out of um, Port Canaveral. And I think we'll see the, the wish start out with three and four day closed loop that go to Nassau or Key West and the private island. Just guesses, yeah. if I had to guess, just based kind of on how they tend to redeploy the ships once they bring new ones in. You know, the easiest way to get the most people onto the wish is to have it do short loops attached to a Disney stay. So if I had to guess, if I was a gambling lady, that, will let, that would be <laughs> the closest, that would basically what my perfect scenario would be yeah. itinerary wise. Cause and that would get, yeah. Would I was say, that would get so many people on it, you know, for all those people that need to check off the next cruise ship on their, the next, you know, the next, yeah. You know, Oh, here yeah. we go. We have a comment that yeah. says Disney made sure to put an emphasis on the different Disney franchises in their teas. So I expect Star Wars, Marvel, and Pixar to play a uh, and more to play a big part in the wish. Okay. So they're gonna ruin this beautiful princessy lobby with like a Oga's Cantina on there. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Um so I think if we're going to do Pixar, this is another thing. And Ryan and I have talked about this was, do you think that it is going to be a traditional water coaster like the other four existing or water coaster, water slide, what the four existing Disney ships have? Are they going to mix it up and follow like what the Odyssey of the Seas and the Carnival Mardi Gras are doing and going with an actual roller coaster at sea. Yeah, I don't know. It, I'm trying to look for pictures. Um, it, there was, I believe it was from Disney Cruise Line blog on Twitter. He showed the model of it. Mm. Uh, I'll, I'll say this. That. It would not shock me if they did, um, but it also wouldn't shock me if it's something completely different, you know, because Disney is not afraid to break the mold. 
So they are not afraid to give us something unexpected. Um, sometimes they, they give us exactly what we expect or less than we expect. This uh, is listen to, all this, listen to all of this. This feels like the 50th celebration all over again. <laughs> I know. Oh, we had all these well, hopes. Yes. It's going to be like, here's a color scheme. Here's this is what Captain Minnie is going to look like. Here's some fancy costumes for Mickey and Minnie. You're but, also going to get Star Wars Day at Sea and Marvel Day at Sea. Um, but I don't know. We can hope, right? Right. Okay. Is there a character or a theme? So we know on some ships we have the Snuggly Duckling. We know, obviously, Animator's Palette. We know Tiana's Place. Is there any kind of character or storyline theme that you would like to see reflected in either a lounge or a restaurant on the Disney Wish? I do like Pixar. I think um, just thinking about me personally traveling with my family, like I have a girl and a boy, you know, the princess stuff is all great, but if we're going on a princess cruise, not, not princess cruise line, but a <laughs> cruise with all Everybody these princess cruise. things, <laughs> um, it would be nice to have a dinner or, you know, a Star Wars day at sea or something um, that is a little more targeted to those who aren't interested in, in um, princesses, whether it's a boy or a girl, but the, you know, just people who aren't super into the princesses. So and my son loves I'm, Pixar, so I'm a big proponent Pixar. of Pixar. So I think if we, if I think about it a little bit more, I think it would be really cool if they, you know, Disney Cruise Lines have the three different areas for kids, tweens, youth. Mm -hmm and teens to hang out. And then the whole water area that also has splash pad and stuff. And I think there's so much in the Pixar movies that you could almost center those kids areas and the water park area around, you know, just look how cute we were just there. How cute still is Toy Story Land? Right. It is just right. adorable. And well, like the, bring ba the baby area could be Nemo. There's, yeah. There's so much like the there's calming, so yeah. The calming thing, you know, it's there's so many things they could do in those areas that would be perfectly, perfectly Pixar. Mm -hmm. I think we're going to get an expanded version of it's called like so I'm trying to remember the because it wasn't themed the night that we had dinner in on the dream and like the royal table or something like that was pirate night, so we didn't get to experience it in all of its glory. But I think given what they know about Be Our Guest at Magic Kingdom and some of the things they can, they can achieve in, a, again, mm -hmm. a big dining room area, I wouldn't be surprised to see something more themed towards Be Our Guest as one of the rotating main dining restaurants. Um, it just kind of goes with a little bit of the, if, you, if they're centering the lobby around the castle, why right. can't... The dining, the three dining rooms, kind of be themed around the other castles in the Disney Wish World. Um, I think, outside of like theming, though, it's the Wish, and they all they really did play up the whole castle element when how they're talking. I'm gonna say all this, and it's gonna end up being an Ogus ca Cantina in uh, Woody's lunchbox. <laughs> on Woody's board. lunchbox is gonna be what their what Cabanas has become is now Woody's lunchbox. <laughs> Um, yeah, allow the rinse repeat. Yep. Hopefully not. Hopefully not. You know, I feel like one of these times I'm going to make a lot of wild guesses and they're really going to, really going to hit. I'm going to hit, I'm going to hit on one of them. And I'm going to be super, super excited about that. Any other thoughts about the Disney wish? I'm, I'm curious about price point and I'm curious about stateroom setup. That is the other thing. Now we know it's going to be the biggest of all of the Disney ships, but that's not surprising. Everyone is just going bigger and better. They already have, two that are they already have two that are capable of cruising the Panama canal during Hawaii and Alaska. Um, I don't think they have any, Oh, in the Mediterranean. I don't think they have any intent of uh, doing Galapagos or anything like that when they can do an adventure by Disney kind of thing. Yeah. Um, yeah. And partner with someone else that already does that. So Disney Wish. And like, honestly, as, and 
my husband and I had talked about this a lot. Like, as big of a Disney fan as I am, and as much as I want to travel and see as much of the world as I can, if I'm going somewhere like the Galapagos, like, I don't need it to be on a Disney ship. I'll take the Disney hospitality and the Disney, you know, attention to detail and the production and the show and the quality that, yeah. you know, um, Adventures by Disney provides, but I don't need it to be on a Disney ship because that, that there's so much other stuff. I don't need to worry about having dinner with Tiana and having Mickey send me off. Yeah, no, that's the kind of thing that I want, like, a real, like, scientist and explorer yes. and a naturalist. To me, that's how, when I did Alaska, I listened, I went down and listened to the naturalist every day. You And yeah. we normally would do two or three different presentations from the animals to the climate, to the region, to the native history, to all that kind of stuff. That's what I want from a, right. what I consider an explorer tour, right. Um, right. which is Galapagos, which is Alaska, which is parts of the Mediterranean Right. All of that. Well, well, we'll see how wrong I am tomorrow at 10 a.m. our time. I signed up for an alert, so I cannot wait. I'm sure Teeth will be blogging all about it, and maybe we'll jump on for an happy, a happiest hour or something to talk about it later on Thursday. We also have more Disney rules. We'll stay kind of in Florida since Cruise Line is in Florida. So today, uh, the mayor of Orange County, where the city count, Jerry Demings, uh, kind of relaxed social distancing guidelines for the theme parks in the area. Um, and he kind of laid out what they have to get to. The thing I wish the CDC and every other thing on the planet would do to get people to get vaccinated is they said, we've, we're about to reach 50% vaccination and you can do this. We get to 60% vac vaccination. You can do this. We get to 70% vaccination. Guess what? Everything is back in play. So with these new, we haven't yet, or Disney has said, not said they're doing anything yet. It's mostly going along with the CDC guidance that masks aren't needed outdoors and reducing social distancing space to three feet versus six which would obviously allow for Disney, Walt Disney World, to have an increase in park capacity. What do you think about that? So, and just to clarify, this is what Orange County has said. Disney has not said that Disney they're moving anything. Mandates. Right, Dis all mass mandates are still in place. Now we've seen some, have you seen pictures of some of the markers getting removed in larger areas, not in queues, but in, um, just more like open spaces because mm -hmm. when we were there even just a few weeks ago i mean there's like stickers all over the ground there's everywhere you walk it's like if i don't know what six feet is by the end of this um i need to get my head checked but because there's feet, markers six feet is, is two teats is stacked on each other laying <laughs> on the ground um two teats is or one angela just laying on the ground is roughly six feet mm -hmm. We've also seen the removal of the hand washing stations, um, like the portable ones that were throughout the park. So Disney's not coming out and saying these are some of the guidelines we're relaxing, but they are removing the like visual reminders of this. I don't, I don't know. That's I guess how I would phrase it. Um, we're seeing more cast members called back. So it definitely seems like they are ramping up for a summer if not a late summer of increased capacity. That's kind of how I see it. Yeah. What do you think? I think we're likely to see them move towards the three foot social distancing and just up. What? what? Look at Teets roll. Why are, why are you rolling your eyes, Ryan? Um, He's got to type faster than this. Uh, I think we're going to see this go down to three feet, though I don't think they're going to say it because let's be honest, it's self-policing anyway, and right. people don't really follow it. Um, I think they'll just start remo continue removing those markers because yeah. when we were at no point, no, granted, we didn't stay in a lot of queues, but at no point did any cast member come and say, like, you're not six feet apart, you're not six feet apart. Um, so it, it is self-policed. And I also didn't, you know, I think I would say we were pretty good about it. We had a big group. Um, 
no other I didn't see with us or with anyone else any other guests say like hey can you back up or hey can you scoot forward um like it, it felt like everyone who was there was comfortable with the distance that everyone was giving everyone else yeah I was like Angela was full prepared to have a meltdown if anyone got too close to her and it seemed like she was the more person doing the creeping up in the front of the line than anyone else yeah. you know I didn't I didn't, it didn't bother me. Like the crowds were the crowds. I just wish they were more transparent. Like that's not 35% occupancy. It's 35% of what the fire code for every single space on property combined together was, but not just for that specific park. And I literally will die on this hill about that. <laughs> you can at yeah. me. I'm never <laughs> gonna, I'm never gonna believe that any of these parks were at 35%. Nope. Can't sell that igloo in this desert, sir. Um, I think masks are going to stay around at least until July. Probably yeah. after 4th of July weekend. I think that's kind of what the administration is targeting. And I honestly think for most places, you know, here in New Orleans, we've had a mask mandate since May. The state has had one since what, July? Um, so we can't keep track that, anymore. I just know that, we're still under it. <laughs> we are. We're going to be under it for forever. For forever. Yeah. Um, so uh, I don't know. We'll see. So I think the um, master is stay around. I think they're up capacity and just ask people, like, still do the announcements, probably not as often. Uh, yeah. You know, the three feet thing. I don't think we're gonna have character interactions. And to be honest, I kind of prefer, I told the gang on Monday, I actually like the little tableaus that the characters would go out and perform on mm -hmm. at Hollywood Studios to just like the cavalcade, like when we got stuck behind that cavalcade at yeah. Epcot. It's terrible. I like the cavalcades. I like the cavalcades. I like the cavalcades. But I think like I pref almost prefer them when they like pop up and surprise you in certain areas in the park, like at Epcot and Hollywood Studios right. versus just the roundabout that they do at um, at Epcot and definitely at Magic Kingdom, like the little mini parades that they do. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I don't think we're going to have characters back until there's no social distancing required. Um or unless Disney requires all of their entertainment employees to be vaccinated. Yeah. And I don't know I that they'll, yeah. I don't know that they're gonna get that political about it. That'll so that's about, that's about Walt Disney World. We're gonna, one more Walt Disney World topic. The biggest thing they need to bring back is shows. Festival of Lion King will be a big test. So- I agree. Um, I'm curious to see how they do spacing and social distancing in that. So we didn't do any shows. We definitely didn't do, well, I didn't do Country Bears. Did y'all go to Country Bears at Magic Kingdom? No, but I did for the first time in forever. I did a sing-along in February. They, they distanced everyone. It's a huge amphitheater. I, I don't know that capacity compared to Lion King. I would guess they're it must be pretty similar if they're opening Festival of the Lion King. But you have the Fantasmic Amphitheater that's sitting empty. You have the Rivers of Life that, um, Amphitheater that's sitting empty. You have Beauty and the Beast Amphitheater that are sit that's sitting empty that are open air. Like, and why Beauty is and Beauty and the Beast back? Beauty and the Beast is huge people fantastic. eater. So basically, like... Our restrictions here in Louisiana for live performance are your capa your capacity could be up to 75% if you can prove that they can stay socially distanced, so at least three feet apart. Or right. your capacity, performance capacity can be 100% if all of the people watching the concert are wearing a mask. That goes for sporting events, too. And right. they just said, yeah, the the Pels, well, that's not going to happen here in New Orleans. It's right. going to happen everywhere else. And the only caveat to all of that, the one thing not, the one condition that will never change is there has to be six-foot space from where the performance space ends 
and the first row of spectators begins. That's it. And okay. I, the, you, they don't have to have plexiglass anymore. None of that. 100%, if you're masked, you can go indoors to a concert and you just have to be six feet away. I don't understand how they can't bring any of these shows back. All of these just shows- Indiana all, Jones? Do, it's all, the space between, you, you go and you set people, you put dots, just like- yeah. That's what they yeah, have it uh, first time in forever. Um, well, you just or, or people emo just, too. Again, you just trust people that they can self police themselves for these things. Right. Right. Nemo too. Nemo is a huge theater. Now that cast is a lot bigger than first time in forever. Those mm -hmm. cast members stayed six feet apart on the stage. I mean, there's what like four, five, five. Well, because it's two members. storytellers and Kristoff and then the Anna princesses, Elsa. right? Yeah. So. Yeah. I mean, when we're talking about Nemo and Beauty and the Beast, there's, there's a lot more cast members, but other, uh, I don't know, other performers so are, it's it's happening elsewhere. I mean, when we were in Gatlinburg, all the Dolly Parton shows are going on. Uh, that's, you're going to get Angela there. So the, <laughs> you know, the only show we did at Universal we, was we did the Jason Bourne Stunt Spectacular. That's indoors. And they basically broke you up into groups and every group, the row in front of you was empty and you had three seats between your group and the next group. And all the stuntmen, and there was a bunch of them at times on the stage, all wore masks, which you, so you couldn't see if the Jason Bourne right. guy was really hot or actually looked like Jason Bourne. You just assumed he did, but they were all masked and it took nothing away from the show. You got to sit in and enjoy all of it. You know, they yeah. can take, American Adventure is still running, right? Muppets is still mm -hmm. running. They can take the yeah. same kind of seating guidance from that and apply it to these outdoor shows where as long as they're wearing masks, it doesn't even, it doesn't even matter. Right. You can sit like, right next to people. No, I, in, this like, is, I know in Nemo, yeah, I'm sorry. We're going on too long about this. <laughs> yeah, no, this is, this is another thing that another one I'm going to die on. And this time I really am going to side with all the neg Disney Negatorians and say, this is Disney just being cheap and not wanting to bring the entertainment contracts back. And I think that's gross. Yes. Okay. I think we was, saw the um, the performers in Hollywood, the people, the citizens of Hollywood. I think they have breathed their last breath because of COVID, and that makes me so, so incredibly sad. sad. It was one of my favorite things when we were younger. It was one of my grandmother's favorite things when we would go. She would literally just sit and wait for them. And there used to be so many, like when we would go in the nineties and do that, like there would be so many citizens of Hollywood up and down and up and down Hollywood and high. They were fewer and fewer throughout the years. And I just, I think we've seen the last of them and it makes me so sad. Yeah. It's, you know, I don't know. We gave up some things. We gave up some entertainment things and you have to reroute the budget for things like the walk around people at Star Wars, but we don't even see like the little robot army or whatever that's out there. Yeah. We don't even have characters and characters aren't even entertainment equity contracts. Right. That, that's a good cool thing. So the last note that I have on Walt Disney World before we move to the West Coast is if we haven't bummed you enough out about the state of Walt Disney World and COVID and you want to go at Christmas. It's we do so far a, away. It's so, so far away. The away. world is going to be totally different by then. Like 99% vaccination by then, right? Well, you better hope we get that vaccine for the kids 12 to 15 by the end of the summer. Then maybe, yeah. Um, Crescent Lake Club would love to spend Christmas with you. And to that end, we have one of the lowest rates you are going to find on property for Christmas and New Year's Eve, if you'd like to do that as well. Um, we have a Crescent Lake Club Christmas block at Coronado Springs for a campus or a casitas room. Casitas. It starts at three thirty-seven per night plus taxes. If you would like to be in the Grand Destino Tower, that is four hundred one per night plus taxes. We'll be able to start booking that next week, 
And there are some special perks that come with booking with the Crescent Lake Club for Christmas. Will you ever remember in your room or in your party will receive a special holiday Crescent Lake Club magic band that you can use during your trip. And you'll also get the planning services of all of us. So if you're just thinking about pricing up Christmas, I'm gonna tell you, if you look at the website, Pop Century and Art of Animation are $300 a night. Why stay at a value when you can stay at Coronado Springs? And you can take the bus, you can be away from the line for the Skyliner. You don't have to worry about getting into a Skyliner crash because you don't have to take the Skyliner. So also it's very um, Feliz Navidad at Coronado Springs during the holidays. There's so many things to do, especially with all the new, if you didn't get to visit, any of the restaurants or lounges in the new tower before the pandemic, this is a great chance to try Coronado Springs again and absolutely fall in love with that. So watch our social media and our website, crescentlakeclub.com for official booking dates. But that's gonna be the price range. Right now we have limited rooms, but we can always add more. Um, and the now, tower, sorry, real quick, the tower feels like a deluxe resort at a moderate price and at a so very beautiful. good moderate price. It feels deluxe. So, so yeah, if you're looking for deluxe, I can go ahead and tell you, I can get you Grand Floridian for $999 a night plus tax. And that's for an outer wing garden view building. So when I tell you that these prices, uh, Caribbean beach is close to $500 a night, 337 for Casitas, 401 for the tower. And to have all that Christmas magic at Disney, after not having it last year, or possibly if you didn't travel the year before, you know, it's a great way to surprise the family and get some of that magic back, get back to your new yep. normal of holidays, maybe do a big family group trip for some family magic. But like I said, just watch our website and our social media for new, more news on that. And now we'll head to the West Coast real quick. Uh, cast member previews have already started for the reopening of Disneyland. And so right now it is only available to California residents. So hopefully in the next couple of months, we'll see that lift again, possibly by July. But the cool thing, Disneyland is opening with some new additions to the Haunted Mansion and a reworking of the Snow White ride. So we're interested to see more visitors and what kind of content leaks out from that. And hopefully the club will be able to take a trip to Disneyland at some point this summer or fall. What do you think about the Disneyland reopening? Um, I've been watching lots of Instagram stories of uh, Disneyland cast members, people crying, people just being so excited to be back. Um, watch lots of stories uh, for the taste of, taste of Disneyland. What was, what was that thing? Touch of um, Disney. Touch they should have gone with taste. They I don't know why I keep saying Disney. taste. Uh, I think it was a taste Disney. of the festivals and it's a touch of Disneyland, right? You keep saying that because Getting all their touch of Disney is weird. It's weird. Touch of Disney. Um, <laughs> it's so weird. Um, but it was just so wonderful to see the cast members so happy literally crying tears of joy to be back um, in their happy place, to be back in Disneyland. Um, so I'm excited for them. I'm excited for the California residents that can go back. Um, I know some people are a little peeved about some of the pricing structures and whatnot. Um, but I think, but we know, I mean, we know California is a different ballpark than Florida in terms California of what they're going to allow. I mean, it always yeah. is. It always in California is. was always, I feel like, per day per ticket, it was more ex more expensive, especially for the two park hopper. But when you see that like hopping literally means just yeah. walking across a yeah. tiny little esplanade, it's absolutely the best deal on the planet. Yeah. So I'm excited. I love Disneyland. I hope you get to go to Disneyland soon. Yep. I hope you and I can go to Disneyland soon together. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'm excited to see it open. Um, I know people, you know, purists were griping that things aren't perfect just yet, but come on guys, it's been it's been closed a for a while. It's been a minute, you know, 
just be patient. Everything will be back to the way that you remember and the way you want it to be soon enough, which is and if the it's last not, thing. not, he didn't build a museum, right? Didn't, didn't no. Walt say that? He, he always wanted to build a museum. Think, he didn't build a museum. He wanted things to change and evolve. And sometimes when you go through a global pandemic that kills millions of people, sometimes things have to change. <laughs> Uh, I mean, the country bears aren't in Disneyland anymore. I don't know why they're still in Walt Disney World. We should follow that lead. I'm trying to see if he's still watching. <laughs> Tolerance levels in, in California are a little bit different than they are in Florida. That's why we yeah. have country bears. Those, those, country, those country bears got me too out of California like decades ago. Yeah. So yeah, just the last, the last thing that's starting to return to normal is the cruise line industry. Um, I posted a blog item today, kind of rounding up where everything stands with some of the major domestic cruise lines, what they're offering. We're seeing a lot of redeploying and reporting of ships that normally travel out of domestic ports, and they are moving to some of their visitor ports, which potentially could remain as home ports for future cruising seasons. So this is something to watch. Um, it's kind of like how Courtney and I are talking. We were interested to see what the itineraries for the Disney Wish are going to be. Yes, my um, Interested to see what the itinerary for the Disney Wish is going to be and what Disney is going to do with their cruise ships. You know, to go circle back to that, I wonder if this UK only cruise to nowhere works out if they don't just try and keep a ship up there year round, one of the smaller ones, and that would just serve as their Mediterranean ship hmm. and do two separate Mediterranean itineraries and then just cruises out of the UK as well. That would offer something completely different. And there is a big European especially from the UK client base mm -hmm. for both Disney and Disney Cruise Line. Then you give yeah. the Galveston ship to us permanently. And yeah, and then our ship would go Panama Canal, do a couple sailings of Hawaii, do the summer in Alaska because nobody wants to go to a cruise to the Caribbean from New Orleans through the Gulf of Mexico during hurricane season in September. Yeah. In September. <laughs> no, thanks. Uh, oh, I like it. My, I, my thinking is all coming together. Give them a, give it. them a little call. Give them a ring. Yeah. Yeah. Let me, let me go get, I don't know. I don't even know who I talked to there. Let me, let them, let me hit them up on Twitter and be like, Hey, I've got an idea. I've Y'all want to, y'all want to think about this before tomorrow's big announcement. I know it's something you can just change real quick. So we're starting, we're still waiting for the CDC to give guidance on domestic loop cruises. Um, hopefully within the next couple of weeks, a lot of them are still holding out hope for the July 4th date and to make their July sailings go, but we shall see. Other than that, I think that kind of covers all of our travel news from this week. Yeah. Uh, Velocicoaster is testing on Friday for cast members and then annual pass holder previews are this weekend. So I'm sure we will see a lot of fun spoilery news from Velocicoaster. And uh, I hate that I have a reservation and I can't go. I haven't canceled it yet, but screw you spirit. This is the first time I'm mad at you because you don't have two flights in the same day. Why you do me dirty like this? <laughs> but anyway, I can't believe you're so, not making it work. <laughs> trust me, I've tried six ways to Sunday. <laughs> I just don't. Even if I could make it logistically work, is Velocicoaster worth having to? fight off being served divorce papers for <laughs> going for one day just to ride a roller coaster. But think of the content. Think of the, you know what? I totally forgot to keep using my gimbal and doing content over my birthday weekend. So 
Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I wish I had a stronger bullet in the chamber on this one, but this is going to be a battle that I will 100% lose. So um, my hope now is that I just beat Teetsy to it because Teets is going 4th of July weekend to Florida. I tried to warn him. It's going to be hot. real hot. It's going to be real hot and it's going to be real humid. You better hope it rains every day. That's all I got to say about that. Um, we're having more. Oh, Universal. We've got new hotels, Sapphire Falls and possibly Aventura are set to reopen in May. So we're starting to see Universal kind of return to a little bit of normal there. I think finally Mardi Gras is going to end <laughs> next week. Jesus. Oh, <laughs> all the way through Easter. <laughs> Why not to celebrate all the way through Easter? Like, all of I carnival said, season, all of Lent, all of Easter. Just all of it. Just bring us all back. of it. Like just you I loved it. It was really cute. And I thought the food festival was really fun. I thought their price was better than like the Epcot ones. And I liked what they were doing. But I'm like, come on, just be a little bit honest. And after this long, stop calling it Mardi Gras. Right. Just call it the carnival, like International Festival of Flavors or something like yeah. that. And you can still have the Mardi Gras floats and stuff out there and do all that because, like, oh. we do parades yeah. for everything. Right. But just don't, don't call, call it Mardi Gras. Mardi. Don't That's call it Mardi Gras. That's the hill I'll die on. Oh, we know. <laughs> I didn't eat king cake there at all. And they had a lot of king cake looking things. I did have a king... A, bourbon milk punch but I told him to leave the king cake syrup out of it hmm. you can keep so your NOLA transplant card I'll allow it all right thank you thank you I don't someone ate king cake out of season and that's how we ended up with the Mardi Gras we had last year in this pandemic I'm convinced of it I like that C convinced so I think unless you've got anything else we may wrap this up I don't I don't so Thanks again to Papillon Prince Sommelier. Thanks so much. Um, oh my gosh, it was great. If you guys have questions for her, uh, leave them in our in the comments, and she says she'll come back next week to answer them. Um, don't forget, if you're watching us on Twitch, hit that purple follow button. If you're watching this on YouTube, please do me a huge favor and hit subscribe and the notification bell. Also, watch our social media tomorrow because we are going to be doing a subscriber giveaway for our YouTube channel. Are you missing Disney and those H2O products? Because I just got it in the mail today and I am going, we are going to select one lucky winner to win a collection of the H2O products. Those shower so towels good. and shampoos that you use when you stay on property at Disney. And now that you can't steal the little bottles anymore, they just come in the big bottles. Here's your chance to have one last collection of little bottles. So watch our Instagram tomorrow and find out how you can be the big winner of that. Um, programming notes, we're taking off this weekend. So no Crescent Lake Club Live on Sunday, no Marvel Monday. Our next show will be back together with Courtney and I on Wednesday for another Wind Down Wednesday. And we should have so much to talk about. Um, I'm really excited. Things are starting. We're starting to see different changes in. We might see an occupancy change. Uh, we know that Boardwalk Resort is opening back up and we have a few more resorts at Disney opening back up in the coming weeks. Maybe we'll finally get news about Port Orleans. We'll see, but uh, for for Courtney and I, thanks you guys so much for joining us. We'll see you next Wednesday. And don't forget to check out all the news on our social medias and our website, crescentlakeclub.com. We'll see you guys later. Bye. Bye.